In this video I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about my FPV 250 that I built. I'm going to show you the parts that I used and the tunings that I did and hopefully if you have one similar to this then if you use the same settings hopefully we can get similar results. Now if you already have a flying quadcopter and you want to tell me the tunings are all different for every quadcopter that's fine I believe you but if you have similar parts then your tuning is going to be very similar as well. So as just as a disclaimer these tuning parameters I'm going to give you aren't perfect. You, they are a good baseline to start with and you can adjust off of them, but they should be pretty close. Anyway, let's get started on this. Starting with the frame, this is a plastic frame. It's pretty heavy duty plastic and this is called the FPV250. If you get the extra fiberglass uh, extensions here on the front and on the back and the top plate, they call it the FPV250 long frame. And it's just gets its name because it has a long frame instead of a little short X with a, little, a couple little bumps on the front and back. For the motors, I'm running DYS-1806-2300 kV motors. These motors work real well on 3S, and I've also ran them a lot with 4S. These, these motors also work real well with these 5x4 propellers that I'm using. The 5x4 propellers give you a lot of extra lift and a lot higher top speed than your 5x3s. Now, if you have 5x3s like this, these are really good propellers to start with. If you're just learning to fly, the nice thing about these is they won't be like crazy crazy speed and they are actually pretty easy to control. Now if you are um, thinking that you're a little better than 5.3s, maybe you should try some of these 5x3 five 3-blade three, three propellers. I've had real good luck with these. In fact, these seem to spin very smoothly. I feel like I, it, the thing is just gliding on air when I use these 3-blade propellers. Now the difference between a 3-blade and the um, these 5 by 4 blades is that these have a, what I feel like has a higher top end speed to them. These can, this, the, these propellers here will pull this quadcopter faster than these 3 blade propellers do. So these are the Afro 12 amp ESCs. You could get 20 amp or 30 amp or 40 amp, but really what determines what size of amp you should get is how much power your motor is going to draw. Because if your motor draws more amperage than what these things can handle, that's when these will burn up. <laughs> I speak from experience. They, you will burn these up if you pull too many amps. Now these, uh, these have never burned out my 12 amps and I'm not really positive what the overall amperage is these things can pull. But these are 12 amp and I've had zero problems with them. I ran them with Simon K firmware for a long time and then when the BL Heli started getting more popular with the one shot and stuff I switched this over and it's actually running uh, BL Heli 13.2 firmware now and it's and it works real well and when the big thing about about the one shot is when you have your motor spinning and you let go of the throttle the propeller what you know the movement of the propeller will just keep it going and it'll just slowly slow down and then stop what the one shot does the one shot will actually try to stop the propeller now that's good because like if you drop your throttle down you want the propeller to slow down too and the big thing that that helps with is dropping if you're if you kind of get that little glidey feeling like whoa kind of sliding you know gliding too much the one shot will take care of that by slowing the propellers down as you let go of the throttle which will cause the cause it to drop faster that's good as long as you have good throttle control if you don't have good throttle control you probably shouldn't be flying one shot but you know teach his own for the flyboard in here I'm using a NASA 32 acro and what I have back here in the back hooked up to it is I have the piezo buzzer and also have a connection right here going to my battery and that's so that the NASA 32 knows how much battery voltage is left in the battery and it can read it through this um, set of pins here closest to you right now and the middle set of pins is for the piezo buzzer the piezo buzzer allows you to have low voltage alarm on your NASA 32 although it's not very loud and it usually just kind of beeps a little bit and sometimes you're wondering did you really hear it or did you not oh, well I don't know I'll just keep flying <laughs> but the NASA 32 when it's tuned properly is awesome now I fly with the Tranus receiver and one big advantage of the Tranus receiver is that when you use a D4R2 such as this one right here, the D4R2 can actually output the uh, voltage back to your Tranus so your Tranus can have low voltage alarms and stuff set up on it so that you can have a low voltage alarm in your hand instead of relying on one like this piezo buzzer that's covered up there, like this piezo buzzer back here. So you really have three options you know when it comes to um, telemetry. You can use the D4R with the NASA 32 telemetry free sky output or you can use the D4R2 with the FBVS01 uh, little free sky device 
or you can just use a piezo buzzer. The piezo buzzer is the easiest to set up because it's all turned on by default and all I have to do is just plug it in. The other stuff actually takes soldering and figuring out. So on this one, I'm not using any landing gear and you can kind of see some uh, corners getting roughed up a little bit from the landings because I do a lot of landing on concrete and uh, driveways and stuff. And it's okay, if, you, if I was gonna recommend to somebody, I'd recommend that you actually use the landing gear that's included. But we, what usually happens to me is I have it zip tied on here, you know, or something and it falls off out in the grass and then I'm flying around with three of them because I can't find it. Then it doesn't take, doesn't land flat on the concrete because it's missing a leg and, Ah, oh gosh, on and on about the landing gear. But if you have it, use it. If you don't, yeah, you know, you'll be okay. Just don't have anything hang down low below your cage like these wires, like I do, because these will tend to catch on the concrete and get a little rub burn, rubbing on them. And, uh, but, you know, if, if they get too bad, just replace them. For the FPV gear on this, I'm using an Eosheen FPV kit that comes with this LT200. Uh, there it is. LT200 transmitter back here. The reason I like this is that it can stand up on end back here, mount directly to the frame, and it doesn't take up much space. Now I've had real good luck with this. I do get a little bit of lines and stuff when I go around trees, but you know, a little bit of fuzz in them, in the goggles, but nothing that's not flyable. And, uh, and actually on this one, what I did is I have another video showing this, but I uh, took some props, um, prop adapters and put them in here to lean the camera back. I have three on the bottom behind the two bottom screws and I have four between the two upper screws and that just makes it lean, makes the camera, there we go, lean back just a little bit so that it can, I, when it leans forward I can still see a little bit better than as if it was actually pointing perfectly straight. The antennas coming off your D4R need to be 90 degrees away from each other. Well, some people put the little bug antennas up here on the front, which I just don't have any. So what I did is I put one right here that just stands straight up, and the other one lays back here across the back of the, um, the quadcopter here. Now this isn't so bad for this frame because it's mostly plastic through here, and these radio frequencies have no problem going through plastic. If you're using a carbon fiber frame, you don't want this laying across here because the carbon fi fiber frames can actually interrupt the signal and it won't be quite as strong. But with these being 90 degrees apart from each other, I haven't had any problems um, with the receiving on this or any crashes due to the receiver losing a connection. When you ask what kind of batteries that you should buy for your quadcopter, most people are going to recommend these nanotechs, the 1.3s, the 1.5s. The 1.3s will be a little bit lighter and they'll give you a little bit better, you know, ag agility in the air. And but the 1.5s will last a little longer. If you're just learning, you just pick, take your pick because your battery's probably not going to last as long as your hobby interest does, and you'll be buying more batteries later because you will destroy them and they will rip and they will bulge and eventually they won't last very long. Now I have started trying out some other batteries and when I got these Lion Power batteries, these came from Banggood and this is actually a 1500 and this is a 1300. This one is actually rated for um, 45 to 90 dis C discharge. This one is rated at 35. Now this one weighs in about 120 grams and this one weighs in 110 grams. And I really like this battery. I feel like it gets a lot of life out of it, and it's 1500 milliamps, so it's awesome. I mentioned it before, but I fly with the Tyrannus. I fly with the Tyrannus because I've had really good luck with it, and I just couldn't bring myself to spend the $400 that the local hobby shop went on the Spectrum transmitters. It was driving me nuts. But I also fly with these Fat Shark Dominator HDs. Some people think the HDs have bad corners, and on and on and on, but whatever, they're awesome. I had some attitudes, they were awesome too. I've flown with Predators, they're awesome. They just cost more money as you get higher models. The Teleporters, if you bought Teleporters, I'm sorry, they're not very good. Buy some Predators, buy some Dominators, buy some Attitudes. Attitude V1, Attitude V2. If you're not doing head tracking, who cares? They're all good. If you want the DVR functionality that the Dominators give, then get the Dominator HDs or the Dominator version 2s. They're, they're awesome too. Because of the Expo I have set up in the NASA 32 settings, I really don't have any uh, Expo settings on my Tyrannus other than on my rudder. That's because when you're using the PID controller 3, the thing is has like super yaw already. And if you don't have Expo on your yaw, it's gonna be like spinning top when you go to do your yaw and it's just so sensitive. Now, I like my uh, yaw to be sensitive because I flew with a tricopter and the thing whoops around so fast and the quadcopter when I tried it the first couple of times flying with it it just didn't have that yaw feeling. Well, someone said try the PID controller 3. I did 
it has a lot of yaw and it is awesome. So when it comes to power distribution, I didn't actually opt to use a power distribution board. Instead, I just took all the wiring and I soldered it all together down underneath the Nasa 32. And that should be fine as long as you make sure that there's no exposed wiring when you're finished so that it shorts out on the Nasa 32 because that would be very bad. Now you can use a power distribution board if you want. The only thing I didn't like about it was it added a little bit of weight to it, but it would have been a lot easier to do it that way. But also, it makes all this look a little bit cleaner because there's not nearly as much uh, height underneath the uh, in between these two plates here. Now, the other thing I did to power the FPV uh, kit on here, the LT200 and the camera, I actually have a power connection com connection coming off right here. Get this propeller out of the way. Right here is the power connection coming up off of there, and this goes back and plugs in with a JST connector to the uh, board to the. Um, video transmitter back here in the back and the video transmitter itself feeds power up to the Eashine uh, camera up here on the front. That's just all part of the kit. Now I did have to cut off the uh, 3S adapter, the little balance port, and I soldered on this JST connector. And, and the nice thing about that is it allows me to take these uh, screws out of the top and I can disconnect that JST connector and the whole top plate will just come off. It makes it really convenient for working on it. Now this FPV-250, just like this, with all these parts on it, it weighs 368 grams. And you add another 110, 120 for your, uh, for your battery, and you're still not going to be over 500. Now if you add a Mobius on the front or a GoPro, you're going to be pushing your weight limit a little bit. But if you stay on around 500 grams, maybe a little less, maybe a little more, you're going to fly real well. The lighter it is, the more responsive it will be. The heavier it is, just the little bit more doggy it's going to be. You're going to need a little bit more time to pull out at long drops. If you actually flip it, it's going to drop a lot more with the weight on it than it would if there wasn't much weight. And uh, But anyway, I'd suggest flying it without the FPV gear on there, without your camera on it first, because you're going to crash and it's better not to break everything that you have. But this one by itself weighs 368 grams, and that's a pretty good weight. And also forgot to mention the cloverleaf antenna. If you're not flying with a cloverleaf antenna, get one. You're not doing yourself any service by flying with the rubber duck antennas. Even the cheap ones are better than the rubber duck antennas. Here we are in clean flight, and I'm on the PID tuning tab. And over on the far left-hand side, you can see I'm using PID controller 3. Now, I like to use 3 because it has an insane yaw on it and I like the yaw. Now the PID settings that I have in here actually came from Sharpoo at first and then I had to adjust them down because I was getting a high vibration in my motors when I was giving it full throttle. Anyway, these are the numbers I ended up with. Now also with PID controller 3, it also allows you to have the roll rate and the pitch rate set independently of each other. Now that's just an advantage if you want you know, your roll to be faster than your pitch. Now these rates that I'm using here, the 0.85 and the 0 0.0, they're actually pretty low if you're going to be doing rolls and flips with your quadcopter with the FPV goggles on. You need to bump these up to probably closer to 1 or 1 1.03, 1.04, 5, something like that because these are kind of low. Here on the receiver tab, the main thing to pay attention to is the RC rate and the RC Expo. And I think the RC Expo adds Expo into your pitch and your roll. Here on the modes tab, the only thing I have set up is the angle and the beeper. I'm using a three-way switch, and in the middle I have the beeper, and on the all the way thrown, all the way forward, I have the angle turned on. If you have a piezo alarm, be sure you have a beeper somewhere on your transmitter because when you crash, it's a heck of a lot easier to find it when it's actually beeping in the weeds. Here on the CLI tab, I changed the loop time to 2000 and the motor PWM rate to 490. And also you can see here I have the VBAT settings so that you can see what the voltage alarms are set to. And I'm using, I have these all turned on because I'm using that piezo buzzer. Now I also, on this one, don't have telemetry enabled because I'm not using any telemetry stuff, just the piezo buzzer. This BL Heli screenshot isn't actually mine, but I did want to show you what I changed on it from the defaults. Here in the middle I changed the PWM frequency all the way to the right to dampen light, and I changed the motor timings all the way to the right also. Is the motor timing set to high correct? I don't know. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but it does work very well on my quadcopter. All right, let's get some flying footage. The footage from this flight is going to come from the built-in DVR and the Dominator HDs.
first time I ever flew through my own legs. Anyway, this is the FPV 250 that I built. If you have any questions about it, let me know in the comments. I know a lot about this FPV 250. If yours isn't flying right, make sure your motors are spinning the correct way. They should always be blowing into the middle. In the back, they blow into the middle. They should spin this way, into the middle. In the front, they should blow into the middle, or turn into the middle. Uh, make sure your propellers are correct. Make sure that you calibrated your ESCs. Make sure you did the ACC calibration or the self le the level test on the NASA 32. Those are all common problems and they're very frustrating to deal with. And your quadcopter, if it's something's not right, or you got your board turned and you didn't rotate your board in the NASA in the clean flight, it will go and it'll flip over and break three or four propellers. Again, I'm talking from experience very aggravating. Anyway, hopefully yours is flying as well as mine, and hopefully you're having a great time. If you have any questions about it, or want me to try to help you troubleshoot anything, let me know in the comments, and I'll try to help you out as best as I can. And as always, thanks for watching.